Hey, hey, everybody. If you're listening to this, you are listening to the first free hour of this episode of The Shift with Doug McKinty. If you like what you're hearing, please consider subscribing to the show in order to access the full feature-length versions of the podcast, as well as have access to the Members Forum, where we discuss potential topics and interviews and dive deep into the overall concept of The Shift. For only six bucks a month, not only do you get the full-length episodes, but also an opportunity to co-create with me, your host, Doug McKinty, the future of the show. Go to www.theshiftnow.com or patreon.com backslash the shift and sign up today in order to help make the shift possible. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Morning, noon, or night, wherever and whenever you are, you are listening to The Shift. I'm your host. My name is Doug McKinty. This episode was recorded on May 14th, 2021. I'm happy to announce my guest on the program today is anti-communitarian activist and author Nikki Rapina. Communitarianism represents the political, legal, and even spiritual philosophy that binds all aspects of the Great Reset together. Concepts such as social impact investing, smart growth, Agenda 21, and technocracy all function under the communitarian umbrella, and none would be possible without utilizing this philosophy as a foundation. Essentially, communitarianism boils down to the idea that human rights are distinct from and transcendent of individual rights. In other words, once an authority determines what is best for your community, that authority has the right to infringe upon individual liberties, freedoms, and constitutional boundaries in order to accomplish that goal. Though very few of us have ever heard of communitarianism, it has been the driving force behind many social and political movements going back decades. Its progenitor, Amitai Etzioni, began writing about it as far back as the 1950s and became a consultant for the White House in 1979. His profound influence has charted the path for global control under this internationalist philosophy and has been embraced by the United Nations, local and national governments, elite foundations, think tanks, and transnational corporations as the philosophy of the future. Nikki first encountered communitarianism while living in Seattle in the late 1990s when her neighborhood was targeted for gentrification through the Roosevelt Neighborhood Plan. This type of local initiative represents the global-to-local aspect of communitarianism, as those who espouse it often find success in local bureaucracies where state and federal constitutions would prohibit individual rights abuses. As local authorities began harassing neighbors and local property owners attempting to impose this centrally planned neighborhood makeover, Nikki embarked on a research journey that continuously led her back to the communitarian movement and its vision for 2020. Its cult-like jargon could be found throughout a large network of corporations, think tanks, and foundations working through public-private partnerships with many cities all over the world. This extremely well-funded network was unilaterally manufacturing a brave new world from behind the scenes which eradicated individual liberties, created a total surveillance state, and allowed the few in charge of the network to totally control the lives of the many who would be dependent on the new system for sustenance. Nikki then embarked on a decades-long activist career to educate the public and mount a resistance against this encroaching movement. She, along with her daughter, have produced two books, 2020, Our Common Destiny, and the Anti-Communitarian Manifesto, which detail the history of this international movement and its infiltration into many government-sponsored programs ubiquitous across the United States today. Find out more at her blog, www.nikkirapina.blogspot.com, or search for Nikki Rapina on Facebook. As always, you can find out more about The Shift, Sign up for the newsletter, subscribe for feature-length episodes, or look through hours of free content by checking out www.theshiftnow.com. You can also find me on Facebook at Doug McKenty, on YouTube and Odyssey at The Shift with Doug McKenty, and I'm on Twitter at D. McKenty. Please like, subscribe, and share this information within your social media networks as we rely on listeners like you to distribute this podcast. I want to thank Nikki Rapina for agreeing to this conversation. And thank you for helping to make The Shift. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this 79th episode of The Shift. I'm your host, Doug McKenty. I'm happy to be joined today by Nikki Rapana. She is the author of 2020, Our Common Destiny, and the Anti-Communitarian Manifesto. So we're going to be focusing on the concept of communitarianism today. And I am really excited 
to have this conversation because I think it's like communitarianism is like the glue that puts everything together. And I've never really focused on it. So I really enjoyed reading this stuff because it, it gives the philosophy that's the backdrop for a lot of the conversations I've already had. Um, my discussion with Rosa Corey, all the Agenda 21 stuff comes from that. Um, the tech technocratic stuff, the scientism stuff. So my interviews with uh, Patrick Wood, my interview with uh, Julianne Romanello, uh, talking about philosophy and political philosophy. What's been going on really for the last 200 years has been this evolution towards what is turning out to be this, uh, this communitarian ideal. Uh, and uh, so I have Nikki with me today to explain just exactly how that happened and um, what's really going on behind the scenes that most of us aren't allowed to see or don't see or don't notice unless we really do a lot of research into this stuff. Um, but this is a very, very central philosophy that's behind um, a lot of what's happening, especially this last year with the coronavirus and the transitions that uh, we're going through in terms of, of what the United Nations is doing, in terms of ideas about na national sovereignty, uh, in terms of ideas about individual versus human rights. So welcome to the show, Nikki. I'm really happy to have this conversation with you today. Do you want to just kick it in with talking about how I know the book kind of starts with your story in Seattle? Uh, and then how you became aware of communitarianism and what was going on? Start there. <laughs> sure. <laughs> or wherever you'd like to start, you know, just tell well, your story. <laughs> I, I think that um, I, I, I had no idea that any of this was going on. I was completely clueless. Yeah. Um, part of it was I, I'm not really active locally, politically. I mean, I couldn't tell you who the mayor of Seattle was when I started. I didn't really care, okay? And I don't watch television, so I never see the news. Um, and, and this is pre-Facebook. I didn't know any. Now I know a lot about what's going on locally yeah, because yeah. I, I'm in the, the Metal Lakes groups. I'm in, I'm in the Willow group. I, I, I listen. I Matt Super, you know, all the arrests and everything. I see all of that now. But uh, in 99... When I was in Seattle, I, I really didn't, not only did I not know, but I didn't care. I didn't go to meetings. I'm not a meeting type of person. Um, you know, I, over the years I'd done, I had been in AA, uh, pretty active in AA and Fairbanks mm -hmm. back in the nineties, early nineties. And those meetings, I, I went to a lot of those. Okay. Nice. But as far okay. as any kind of, uh, you know, politically oriented. And, and, and that's another thing, you know, AA is, is no political affiliations. It had nothing to do with that. So it was not ever, even ever part of anything that we were discussing. Mm -hmm. um, it was mostly, it was all recovery. Okay. Sure. And I, and I've, I've continued to work in recovery with people outside the program, inside the program. I don't care if they're in recovery you know, I'll work with them, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a big part of my helper person came from that direction. And a lot of what they were doing with this uh, the testing, we were a pilot test in Seattle of the new enforcement. And the new enforcement was of communitarian law. Mm -hmm. But it took me over a year to figure that out. All I knew is they were targeting people who were helpless, who had no tools to fight back. We had two suicides in the neighborhood over some of the actions that they were doing. It was very dramatic for us. And my landlord, um, he was a giant property owner who, who was, had been branded by the city as slumlord because he allowed us to live in i had a six-bedroom house in north seattle for 650 dollars a month so when if they couldn't understand why i was so loyal to you sisley and i said have you seen my rent <laughs> yeah. you know <laughs> yeah, right. because by having my rent be so low i could get, i could help a lot of people okay so and i could legally have up to nine roommates under seattle tenant law and um so I did. I had roommates that paid for a while, but if something happened to them and they couldn't pay, I didn't throw them out. I didn't have to. I didn't need that money. And I wasn't a boarding house. I didn't provide the food, but I did share pretty much anything that we, you know, I didn't let anybody go hungry in my house. Okay. Yeah. So there was that. And you know, it was a good life. We were, I was helping a friend of mine who had, who was mentally ill with um 
uh, manic depression. And she was in a very depressed state when we moved in. So I started cleaning the house, which is why all the, so while I'm doing all this, I just move into this old beat up house. And I'm, you know, living my life that I live right next door at Roosevelt High School is where all these meetings are going on and they're planning an invasion of the neighborhood to take all these properties basically from the landlord who owned them as um, nuis- with nuisance abatements, you know, because an abatement, I don't know if anybody really knows what all these terms are. I didn't. I had to look up everything that came at me. And Hugh wanted me to go to the meetings up at the school. He says, you know, I got to go up to the school and see what they're doing. And I said, I don't know. Why would I do that? Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he went, cornered my daughter one day and she was like, 14 i think at the time and said your mom has to help me she needs to go to this meeting you know and and so she comes in the house and goes mom please just go up there and see what's going on Mm -hmm. so i did and i was appalled they were calling everybody in the neighborhood pigs and trash oh wow and um they had all yeah and it was uh this is University district, just north of UW, you know, a lot of PhDs that take forever to write them, you know, 11 years, some of these people have been living in these little rooms, you know, and, and then a lot of vets and, you know, we had our share of drunks walking down the street. There was a lot of elderly, a lot of elderly that rented rooms to students, um, great restaurants from all over the world, a lot of Asian food, great food. I really miss the food in Seattle. So, you know, there was like a lot of good things about the neighborhood that we loved. We ended up falling in love with Roosevelt. And so when I'm up at this meeting and they're talking about all the people that were there being pigs and trash and how are they going to get rid of them? Mm-hmm. The urban that's blight. When right? I was, yeah, we were urban blight. Yeah. And I had never seen that term either. I had to look that one up. Right. And I left that meeting that night going, whoa, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and the next thing you know, I want to see everything he had, everything that they were giving him. And and inside the the the, the plan, the actual okay, there's two parts to the Roosevelt neighborhood plan. The first part is the plan, the vision for the future. Okay. Yeah. And in that it said that uh we transients have a significant negative impact on the neighborhood. And we were all transients. We were all renters. We were all coming from somewhere else. And and I'm like, what do you mean significant negative impact? These words just burned into my brain. And I was pretty angry, honestly. Okay. Sure. So, so that's where it started. Okay. It started in me thinking you don't get to call my, me and my roommates pigs or trash um, in a public meeting in front of a hundred people and, and plan to clean up my neighborhood. I had already been working on my house. Well, see, I can, I kind of I put, I was a glitch in their plan because I had already started landscaping. <laughs> I was cleaning out the house. I was, they thought I bought it, you know, <laughs> yeah. and they're asking me, well, if you didn't buy it, why are you doing this? I said, well, I live there, you know, I'm like a time I'm, <laughs> I am going to clean it up. Yeah. So, <laughs> During that, you know, and I, I just felt bad for the, you know, there, a lot of these people were mentally not stable. It, a lot of American vets, you know, Vietnam vets, especially, okay, they're messed mm-hmm. up. They've been messed up for a really long time, but they don't hurt anybody. They're not like a threat. Um, I mean, we didn't, I mean, at first I was like really nervous about all these different kinds of people because I was from Fairbanks, Alaska. Okay. But very quickly I learned that we could walk those streets and, and and not have anything happen. And we didn't have like muggings going on or any of that kind of stuff. I mean, people took things out of the yard every now and then, like my hammock. And I was like, well, they probably didn't have anywhere to sleep. You know, <laughs> so that's where they took it. But as far as like, uh, crime ridden, you know. Yeah. And then they have like they had they were citing laws in the they started citing uselessly for violations of the new code, okay? And a lot of them were frivolous and a lot of them were about the the tenants and the tenants uh like they passed a new noise ordinance. I got involved in that. I started going to every meeting I could find yeah. and became the thorn in their little project. And they tried to hire me. 
I got offered grants. I, you know, along the way, it was very interesting. Okay. Some of them I never did get to talk to, but I chased them. I almost had a fist fight with a cop after one of the town hall meetings. Mm -hmm. So there was a point where I had to step back. That was after the raid where they took hostages. They took uh, a bunch of people hostages in these two houses, locked them in a room while they searched their bedrooms and went through private papers. Uh, made, uh, and they had a little BlackBerry where they were putting down all this information about right. these people into a BlackBerry. And that and was just because they felt the house was run down or it wasn't up to code? No, it was suspicion of harboring rats and bugs. Ah. That was the warrant. It was a public health warrant, and it was served by public health officials who left because it got so out of hand. The cops came with battering rams and SWAT teams and blocked off the whole street and went door to door banging on it and pulling everybody out of their rooms. It's like 11 o'clock in the morning, so a lot of people were still in bed. Yeah. In, in, in their pajamas, not dressed, okay, not ready for life yet. And they heard them all in this room, and they all thought somebody got murdered. They found a dead body. Okay, that's what everybody thought there's been a murder, you know. Why else would they do this? And then when they saw the warrant, and they started asking questions about the warrant, it was, it was the responses by this cop. Her name is Officer Hope bauer and she's a community police officer with seattle police department who was assigned to our neighborhood See, because what they had was they had it already set up they, we had a sector manager this sounded so soviet to me everything i was hearing from this people, i'm like what do you mean we have an assigned sector manager <laughs> and, yeah, and yeah, the sure. neighborhood a neighborhood cop that's got a different job than the other cops and she, one of the guys in the room, uh, I, I helped bring a lawsuit against the city of Seattle and King County called Dawson versus the city of Seattle. And um, you can find it online at, uh, um, oh God, what's the name of that site? Anyway, it's online. The whole case is online. And then everything I was writing about the case is online too. Okay. Not attached to that. But Dawson, it was a very significant case because we helped them build case law to do this to somebody else and once i realized that's what was happening i was pretty upset about how how what i thought was going to help everyone ended up um not okay you can't fight them in constitutional parameters you have to you can't because it's not a constitutional court that you're dealing with and the law is community law not U.S. law, and it, and I just wasn't aware of how so that works. This just opens up a huge rabbit hole then. You know, you're thinking that you're dealing with the U.S. Constitution, and you discover that there's a, something entirely different happening behind the scenes that basically nobody else knew what was actually happening, what was driving all of this, this change. No, and when, when, when one of the clients um, said to, to Officer Bauer, you know, we have rights in this country. And I, I felt so bad for these people because they, they didn't know what rights they had exactly. <laughs> yeah. Which amendment gave to them or anything like that. But, right. but they knew they had they had some rights somewhere, you know, and that they might have been being violated. And her response was, you people have too many rights in this country as it is. Wow. Yeah. And after three of the, because I, I was doing interviews with all of these people, I went straight over there. They didn't know me, you know, and I wanted to know everything that had happened because it happened right across the street from me. And um, they, once the third person told me that she had said that, I was like, I got to talk to this cop. And what country is she from? That uh, it doesn't have the kind of rights that we do. Well, this is years before I found out that they were all being trained in Israel. Mm -hmm. Because Israel is the Harvard of anti-terrorism. And all of these techniques of, you know, I mean, these were like SWAT techniques. Yeah, it's were, all the militarization they, of the police has been coming from yeah. the Israelis. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, and it was, and the way they talked to um, us was not like your normal cops do. I started meeting all these real cops in Seattle through the work, okay? And that's what they'd say to me. I'd say, well, are you a community cop? Because I needed to know exactly what I was doing with. And they'd say, I'm a real cop. I'm not a community cop. Uh -huh. You got a real crime, you call me. <laughs> you know, right. so they're not, not all the 
police went along with this uh, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, I think a lot of, especially uh, King County has an elected sheriff, and they didn't even participate in the WTO bullshit. Okay, the riots uh, in '99. Mm-hmm. That all happened. Um, we were actually that raid on that house of the Dawson house was a training exercise for the WTO. Hmm. And I thought that was another city acronym. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the so rabbit hole goes this, deep. Yeah. I'm talking to this cop up at the North Seattle precinct who told me he had been there at the raid. And I and I'm trying to get him to confirm that it was a pilot test for the new enforcement in the Roosevelt neighborhood plan. Cause that's what I, had it down as and i was getting trying to get some kind of confirmation and he said yes it was a pilot test i go okay and for what and i'm thinking i know the answer and he says the wto and i went what and i'm looking through my notes and i went what is that and he goes world trade organization and my response was i'm gonna have to call you back (laughs) because i didn't know what that was i had never even heard of it that's how little attention I was paying to what was going on in the world. So um, I don't blame anyone right now who, <laughs> who's pretty much like me yeah. only 20 years ago. You know what I mean? Coming in and now going, I never heard of any of this. I never heard of that. And and there's so much to learn that it's much easier to just go, you know what? I'm done. I'm just going to go buy land out in the middle of nowhere and I'll see you folks later, you know? So I see that and I understand it. I really do because had I not got sucked in the way I did in Seattle, I would be a completely in a different place. I might have actually fallen for it because it's really the manipulation to get you to go along with um, caring about other people. People like me were the biggest suckers for that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is a lot of people are. Yeah, because there's a lot of nice people in the United States. Yeah. They really are. And they really do care. I traveled all over the country and met people from, you know, every place I went. People hooked me up. You know, they helped me with my car. They gave me a place to stay. They, you know, helped me on the roads when they were snowy. Um, I don't have a bad vibe from Americans, okay? But now I'd be scared. I'd be scared to go out there and travel in this climate. Yeah. It's definitely not the same. So does Things that explain changed. it? And even back then it was called Vision 2020, wasn't it? I mean, now here we are. <laughs> they used the word 2020. The software that HUD had that the cops were using to um put all the input all the data into was called HUD 2020. Huh. And wow. then there was Vision 2020, and then all the military programs were all 2020 programs. Mm-hmm. So it and I had in the one of the first editions of the book, I think two thousand six, two thousand seven. It used to just be a little teeny book before we revised it with all two books in one and all that. Yeah, that I had pages of twenty twenty um, programs and that, that like four or five pages just listing. Right. And so if they in had the used, 90s. yeah. Uh, this was actually it was 2000 or so, right mm-hmm. around there. I found the Communitarian Network in Amitai Estioni on March 30th, 2000. And I went to my first meeting at the Roosevelt High School on March 30th, 1999. So it was weird. It was like a, a, exactly to the a year later that I found him. And then when I found him, <laughs> I was like, they have a name. <laughs> and right. I sent out mass emails to every news editor that I'd written because I had contacted all the news agencies, Oprah, you know. Uh, <laughs> Think, thinking <laughs> we were going to have a debate about <laughs> this, right? <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah. oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> Everybody needs to know this right now. And of course, nobody wrote me back. Um, but and nobody cared that they had a name. And then people started telling me that I had made the name up. Huh. I, I gotta, I gotta say, you know, I've never been a liar. So I was like, really, the more well, I was accused of making shit up, the, the the less I wanted to even deal with the public. So I went in. My, my point is, I went away from the public and the meetings and everything like that, and I just went into study mode. Yeah, yeah, to really and, figure out what's happening. Yes, and and I went camping on the 
peninsula over by Hansville and spent the winter in a tent and figured it out. But it took months, huh. took months being alone. Um, and, you know, and, and a lot of, a lot of crying. Okay. I just like sobbed. Wow. <laughs> praying for, you know, what am I supposed to do with this information? Now that I get it, now that I know, what am I supposed to do with it? And, um, and I, and I try to trust my creator that whatever I'm supposed to do is going to show up right in front of me, you know, that I don't have to go seeking any, anything. It's, it's there. It's my life. It's whatever is my life. That's, you know, what I do. And, um, so I brought the lawsuit and I worked on that and I learned a lot about the corruption in the legal system. <laughs> you know? right. So everything is just a lesson. It was all, it was like lesson after lesson after lesson. It was like, when do I just be done? And, and then I realized you're never done. When you go down this hole, this is such a long drawn out. They've got so many places that they, they you know, it's, it's global. Okay. Yeah. So I, I mean, I was, I focused on my neighborhood, but very within a year, you know, went all the way to the United Nations. That's, and that's what we put on the book was that, you know, we took it from the local level and they kept looking for the authority of law and where is this coming from? And yeah, then you go global and then, you know, England had 2020 and all their plans. Germany had 2020 and all their plans. That's crazy. All the plants around the world were 2020 plants. Well, um, so I just want to clarify for the audience. Do you want to go ahead and, and, and discuss uh, Amitai Etzioni a bit and, and the communitarian network and what had been going on? What Who is this guy and what had he been developing? And how did this show up in your neighborhood, you know? Yeah, how did it show up in all our neighborhoods? Yeah. Um, Etzioni is, um, he's an Israeli former uh, IDF that um, studied under Buber. Um, in fact, he's one of Martin Buber's first students. And after the war, um, the War of Liberation, for uh, the British mandate for Palestine. He grew up in Palestine on the kibbutz and uh, his parents immigrated there when he was a, a small child. Um, they left Germany. His, uh, his, his real name is Werner Falk, hmm. but uh, in the kibbutz, it, he changed it to Amitai Etzioni, which means tree of life and knowledge from Zion, basically. And his son, who is the godfather of AI is named Oren Etzioni, and Oren also means tree. Wow. A little so we got Kabbalah two. In there. We, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was a, he's a Kabbalist. Uh, mm. um, and so and I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what the Talmud was. You know, my way website that we started ended up being just topic pages of all these things that I had I knew nothing about. And so I was sharing what I was learning and where I was studying and where this was taking me with my, all the readers that were, um, you know, looking for the same things. Cause I didn't know anything about Freemasonry, not really. Um, I, and I was kind of shocked with Freemasonry because I thought, you know, if they play such a significant role in U S history, why don't we, learn more about them, you know, <laughs> why are they hidden still if it was a good thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so Edzioni's ties, um, he was funded by George Soros and he's friends with Gorbachev and, you know, I mean, his, he's got the international ties. Right. Um, th there is some speculation from certain parties that he may be Mossad, um, which is, entirely possible who knows and what he when he came to the u.s and i think it was 58 to berkeley and he got his phd from berkeley and became very active in the sds movement and i have a picture of him with a bunch of students at berkeley um radicalizing them and then he went straight from there to columbia where he rose to the head of the department very quickly. You know, I mean, the, every door that this guy needed opened, opened right up for him. And yeah. in 79, 
uh, he was brought into the Carter White House as special assistant to Richard Harden. And um, he's pretty much been a major back behind the scenes player in D.C. since then. And his advice to our presidents has been, um, he's called the everything expert and the guru. So <laughs> Hillary Clinton uh, praises him and it takes a village. Uh, mm-hmm. Clint, both the Clintons were very heavily influenced by Etzioni, Bush. And it's, yeah, to, it's not a left, right thing. It's they all, they all love him. They're all following yeah. this path, whether yeah. it's Republican, they, Democrat, and, whatever. <clears throat> yeah. And his programs were all about service and responsibility and the new uh, requirements for citizenship, which now it's global citizenship. You know, the requirements for global citizenship mm-hmm. are humanitarian. And so mandatory volunteerism was one another one of his programs, which, you know, how can it be volunteer if it's mandatory? You know, <laughs> right. Like, the way the, <laughs> don't worry about that. That's no, yeah, don't yeah. worry about that. You just, you just <laughs> sign up. And, uh, you know, um, AmeriCorps was another one. And then he was also, I mean, he's written now maybe 35 books or so. The, you know, the spirit of community, the new golden rule, you know, the limits of privacy, uh-huh. um, from empire to community, a new approach to international relations, uh-huh. you know. Right. So, and I got a lot of stuff on him from the BBC because he went to England and he did a lot of work in England. And I've actually been contacted by people from people all over the world where he shows up and introduces his you know, uh, philosophical morality, because it's all about morals and ethics. He is the most ethical spokesman. He, he, his, his returning, they came to the U.S. to shore up our social, political, and moral environment, okay? Because we are just immoral people. We're too selfish. We're selfish individualists who only care about ourselves. Right. And we hear that all the time now, right? This selfish individualism is a very prominent feeling among a lot of people now. Well, you can't even say individual without saying selfish. Yeah. Uh, The the words go, and that's what they've done with that was like made it because I, because what I kept saying to them was, I'm, you know, I'm an individual. I don't know. Because the term individualism, when I went and looked that up, I went, no, I don't really like that. (laughs) I don't think that explains uh, Americans. Uh, We value certain things, but we're, we're the most generous nation in the world. We give more in, um, you know, emergency aid than any other people per per capita per income. Even our poor people donate stuff. If they see something that somebody needs help, they 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 hook you up. If they can, they they do it. So it's part of our general culture is giving. Now tell me how we need shoring up. If <laughs> that's mm-hmm. what most smart people already are is generous, caring, and concerned. And they've taken that and turned that into where now, if anybody's generous, caring, and concerned with me, I'm like, get the heck away from me. You know, because <laughs> I, I, I know that you're going to turn that into something where you're going to save me from myself. And that's not the point of, of true generous uh, helping. You let go. You give somebody something and you let it go. That's up to their creator and, and them, what they do with it. So, uh, so I just, I hate Etzioni. I would like to just... Yeah. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you. And so he knows this about me. He follows me on Twitter. I'm thinking about redoing Twitter again because I never put, I, I opened a Twitter account and I never went back. And then I got little notices of people who are following yeah, me. He's checking like, me out. I'm is following you on oh, Twitter. I'm wow. like, oh, I could go in there and just start blasting. <laughs> so I have some plans like that, you know. And, and he's, he's an old man now. He's probably almost 90. Yeah. Um, so, you well, know, the fist of cuffs, that's probably out, but. <laughs> <laughs> will you, will you describe just then his sort of general philosophy of communitarianism that he's been working on this since the sixties or so thereabouts. And, uh, and now his entire career has been dedicated to promoting this, this philosophy. And you've kind of, I mean, this is the interesting thing, like 
this idea of communitarianism where it's it sounds very moral, very high and mighty, very progressive. A lot of people, you know, if you just listen to the language, you're going to think, wow, this sounds great. Um, but this then this notion of, of individual rights automatically gets connected to selfishness. Like someone who has individual rights can also care about their community and be a very giving person. But we're seeing this real dichotomy in communitarianism. So can you give like an overview of what communitarianism is and how it 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 it, it creates these moral values and, and then how it kind of uh, like looks down on, on the idea of individual sovereignty? Itzioni says that individual rights cannot long be sustained without um, a, com a community context. Mm -hmm. So he's the expert on American law. He's the Israeli expert on American law. Right. And when he says we, he doesn't mean you and me. He means him and his buddies in Europe, <clears throat> in the Middle East. So, um, you know, his attitude towards our country is, um, it's snarky. <laughs> I don't know how else, but, but it's like, it's all tongue in cheek. And once you realize that about him, that he's a, he's a magician, I call him a, a master magician at, you know, and, and there's the British figured him out pretty good. There was a whole special on him on the BBC going, wait a minute, you know, right. but he, um, he sees this, uh, the concepts that he wants to bring here are authoritarian in nature, very authoritarian. And basically, he told Chris Katko, who's an artist that I just love, who used to work for the Idaho Register, and he was doing an a article about my work. And after he interviewed me on the phone, he called Etzioni and interviewed Etzioni, which I've never done. Huh. Okay, in all these years, I never called Etzioni up. I was afraid of what I'd say. Anyway, <laughs> um, Etzioni told him that it was basically what they were building was a giant global kibbutz. Right. So in his mind or in his, I don't even know if it's in his mind or whatever, it's about creating a world that is completely controlled by him and his buddies, basically. And his buddies go high up, okay? It's like, the financing from Soros is just one piece of, you sure. know, the, this is when, when you start, because I never took it all the way to the top because my daughter and I have a theory that it's Chinese women playing Mahjong. That <laughs> right. <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> we all because have our all theories see, about that. Right, <laughs> all, you, all you see are these rich men. Where's the women? You know, yeah. aren't there any women in on this? Because it's all goddess worship. I call their God, the green virgin. Right. And so, and it's like, it's, it's mystical, it's religious. It's like, he took all the teachings, the philosophical teachings, the I versus thou, mm. um, from I versus we from Buber and others that were also writing. I think Heidegger was the one there's, there's several. And then I just learned, I'm learning more about a lot of more writers because this is not part of my education, my formal education. Mm -hmm. So everything I learn is from somebody mentions uh, somebody and it's a writer I haven't heard about. I go look it up and then I can see pieces of Etzioni. I, what he did was he just took bits and pieces of all kinds of theories and religions and put it into one giant melting pot. But mm -hmm. I don't think he did it himself because he didn't write all these books they're, he, they're, his name is on them, but even his office assistant, Aaron Riska, confirmed that he doesn't write them because his English isn't that good. Huh. So other people write the books and they put his name on it. So he's the, the figurehead. He's the grandfatherly figurehead. Um, right. And the tie to his family tie to AI, which is a big part of the transhumanism agenda, that goes along with communitarianism and it makes perfect sense. How do you make the perfect model citizen? Well, you take out the human and you can do whatever you want. Right. So the dehumanizing you has to start with anybody that has individual, uh, a concept of themselves as an individual, as a standalone um, entity that what, what goes on with me is between me and my creator. 
right. to nobody else. That has to be abolished. That has to be taken away from me. I have to get my my find my God through the group, right. through the collective, the community, and yeah, the community becomes your God, and that's what he's he's not saying. He won't say that. Okay. He'll say it in all these other ways. And there, and there is around. a religion behind this. I mean, there's this, like, they want to develop a world spirituality that's a blend of all the spiritualities. And at least in my view, they're appropriating a lot of native indigenous language. And they make it sound like we're worshiping the Mother Earth. Um, mm-hmm. Although I can't imagine. Very disrespectful like to it. the indigenous people, in my opinion. Right. Um, it's about I, control. And, and I can't imagine anything more patriarchal, but they, they, they dress it up and make it sound like it's all goddess worship. Woo woo. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that woo woo is pretty woo woo because yeah. it's, um, it also, um, the Luciferian worship, which I didn't understand any of that either. Um, and I had never read the Luciferian, you know, Bible or, any of the writings which I found by them quoting it um, in Kenny Lake, Alaska, wow. where it was School of the Earth, owned by a couple of people who are part of the Wise Consortium, which is very suspicious to me. I did an article on this quite a few years ago. Um, they their website said enlightened citizens make wise decisions, and. So I, you know, I put it in brackets and did a Google search to see where that came from. And it comes right out of the Luciferian Bible. Wow. I'm like, whoa, okay. And then the thousand points of light that Bush and Obama and all those guys were doing, it put that into a whole different perspective for right. me. That's the Luciferian part of this where they um, believe that Lucifer is the good guy and he got a bad rap. And he was actually trying to help humanity and enlighten humanity as opposed to God who said, you can't know all these things. Right. So, uh, yeah. And when I realized that they, they, they believed that, then I was like, I am dealing with some madness here. That's at a level that it, it, I'm not a Christian and practicing Christian anymore. And the, the last religion I practiced was ceremonial pipe, you know, Lakota tradition. Mm-hmm. So nice. Um, I, you know, today I, I just, I just talk to God directly because I don't need that. I don't need, I don't need any implements. I don't need anything to focus on. It's, it's there. And it's the only thing that sustains me. It's the only thing that keeps me going is that I believe in my heart and soul that um, I have to do my job. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not about me having a good life or me having a bad life or me getting what I want or not what I want. It's like, am I doing my job? Am I showing up and um and showing up basically? Just show up for whatever is being asked of you and, and it when it comes, the willingness has to be there too, you know, because you can step out and say, I don't want nothing to do with this anymore. And I've done that many times. I have <laughs> quit the ACL. You always come back. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I go. Well, what happens is I, you know, nobody else follows Etzioni like I do. Yeah. Okay. And um, nobody has, like, when I joined his forum in 2000, when I found him at GWU, George Washington University in D.C., he, the network is established there. And there used to be a link to my website, too, where um, he thought I was kind of funny at the beginning, okay? <laughs> and I joined the forum. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was demanding because he said that the debate over our privacy rights was over and we huh. lost. Okay, well, he didn't say it that way. But right. basically, it had already been decided that our privacy rights were a barrier to the program. So I wanted to know where that debate was and who was debating for my side. Right. And I said, you know, you, you don't get to just debate my rights debate are my constitutionally protected rights without involving uh, two-thirds of the state legislature, number one, okay? This is how you get a constitutional amendment passed. You know, yeah. because I, I was like, if you want to change the constitution, there's actually a path to do that, a legal, legitimate path. Right. Not this way. 
So, well, and that's what's so fascinating is so many of these changes, these legal changes and these philosophical changes, they're happening behind the scenes and then they're getting implemented, but they're really circumventing the constitution, the idea of individual rights. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about, because I know the communitarians, then they talk about human rights. I mean, you've already kind of touched on the surveillance thing, which we're seeing so much of this, like this is all coming to fruition right now, right? I mean, they're, they're, we have no, we're being completely surveilled. It's all about big data now. And they don't, you know, there's no, nobody seems to have any concerns uh, about, about our privacy. You know, I think there was a, there was an amendment in the bill of rights that says we have the right, you know, to privacy, to illegal search well, against illegal search and seizure. And yet they're collecting data left okay. and right and setting up the system. Here, it's yeah, go ahead. Here's how they did it. Okay. Your privacy rights are not in your U S bill of rights. What is the entire system is based on private property rights. Mm -hmm. So everything about, you know, that, that's in there is private property is the basis for it. So first they went after private property and they blurred the lines between the public and the private with their public private partnerships. Okay. Right. And by blurring the line on the property and then going after property owners who weren't good stewards of the environment saying that you needed to prove that you were a good steward of the land in order to own the property I got very involved in property rights, which is how I learned about Donald Trump, too, because he um, he wasn't one of the good guys, let me tell you, um, <clears throat> with property rights, okay, because they, it's called the best use abatement. And if the city can make more money off your property selling it to the rich guy down the street, then they can take it from you under these new programs they have, right. which is what they were doing to my landlord in Seattle. They wanted the property. It's a land war. It's always been a land war. It's about who gets to control the land because when you get to control the land, you control everything on it. And all the humans that are on it are just like uh, incidentals. They're either assets or problems is how they were describing us wow. back 20 years ago. Um, and that was the database was set up to identify us as an asset or a problem. Hmm. And then they had different things that they did with you, <laughs> depending on where you fell in that in those categories. <clears throat> and it was called <clears throat> asset based community development. And it's a whole nother piece of it that will lead you straight to Barack Obama because Barack Obama was trained at the ABC Institute by Professor John McKnight, who's the head of the program at Northwestern University in Illinois. Wow. McKnight is the one who signed Obama's application for Harvard Law School because Obama couldn't find one professor from his college in Columbia to write one. He had McKnight write it. Right. Okay. And McKnight brags about it in a video I have of them. Okay. So, and Obama really had, he was in 2004 at the Democratic Convention, he was called the third way wonder boy. 2004. Four years later, he's president. It was a trip watching right. that go down. Yeah, that was so, that was wild. <laughs> so there's like the the all of the different tentacles, I guess you could call it. You know that that have they've established all these different ways to implement this law through community groups in places where they do have a crime problem. You know, like I've been in Milwaukee. Okay, I've seen him. I've seen the Chicago, uh, the scary. Oh my God, how do people live there? Okay, yeah. they go into those neighborhoods first. They did in Seattle too. They go with the HUD was a big part of this HUD twenty twenty the database, so that everybody that lived and had housing had <clears throat> all of the restrictions that they want to do to you in the private sector. They perfected in the public housing uh, arena. And a lot of the same uh, policing tactics that they used in public housing were moved into the private sector. And we were a pilot test for them moving into the private sector in 1999 with all this stuff they had learned from HUD. But it was all data driven. 
every paper I read said, we need more data. We need more data. We don't have enough data. Yeah. So, and, and so I started telling people, man, they want to know a lot more about you than, yeah. than just your unemployment record and your criminal um, background check, your uh, Experian, um, credit scores, you know. I mean, they already had all that, but no, they wanted your hopes, your dreams, your fears, your affiliations, and who do you know? Yeah. And in the HUD projects, in order for you to have a visitor come and visit you at your home, they have to register and check in when they come in. <laughs> so this is <laughs> yeah. this is when I saw that, and I went, well, "Wow, they think they're going to do this in the private sector." So this is where I'm talking that the individual rights that you hold as living on private property is the last vestige of freedom that you have left. And your privacy rights are completely embedded in the, in now some constitutions, Washington state constitution for one has privacy in it. I think Alaska's does too, you know, so some of them do, but your na national constitution didn't. Mm -hmm. and, and your whole legal system is built around damages to property, criminal law and misdemeanor, very small damages to property, murder, very high damages to property. Yeah. But it's all in, incre in increments of property. Same with civil law. You can't go into a civil court and sue without asking for damages to property. And your own mental health is your own property too. Okay, So that's where that comes from. So it, it, they're having a hard time with this. Right. They've got to get around this. Easy. They get getting around this and trying to convince us. Because what you have, I after they they busted in the houses and they were they were going in houses without warrants in Seattle under the program. They stopped when we stopped them. But I asked everybody, I was doing man on the streets constantly. And everyone I asked, I'd say, can the cops just enter your house anytime they want? And they'd say, Nope, they gotta have a warrant. Now, they didn't know what kind of a warrant, the scope of the warrant, who could issue the warrant. You know, they knew nothing about that warrant. Right. But there isn't an American who won't go, nope, they got to have a warrant. So it's so that is so deeply ingrained into our people, even our most uneducated average Joes. They know what their rights are. They don't know why or how or <laughs> any mm -hmm. of the things around it, but they will stick to that. So that's a hard one for them. Uh, this, well, the chief of uh, police in Seattle called the Fourth Amendment an identified barrier to the program. Wow. That's wow. Yeah. yeah. So they're trying to get around this idea of individual rights. And then um, and you you compare it in the book to the, this concept of human rights, which so they dress up human rights mm -hmm. uh, and then the human rights become the foundation of this. And there's communitarian law now that's not common law, that's not based on private property rights, but it's actually based on this idea of human rights, which allows the government and the authorities to come in and do whatever they want, as long as they can justify it as for the good of the community. Well, it's the difference between positive and negative rights. When people say to me, Nikki, you're so negative. I go, that's right. And so should you be. Okay. <laughs> because negative right means um, the First Amendment to the Constitution. You know, you can't do this and you can't do that. Who are we talking to? The government. Yeah. You cannot stop us from doing this. You cannot stop us from doing that. You cannot come in our house without a legal warrant issued by a a superior court judge, municipal judge, does not have the authority of law to issue a, a search warrant, which is why they need public health warrants, which public health really hates this because they had a legitimate job and a function, you know, and now they've been used. Right. Um, they had, they were, they, in Seattle, they were trying to get Sydney Light to do it. What I found interesting was all of the organizations that had access to private homes, they had a list of things that they wanted them to report on in the houses and put into the database they were trying to get city employees to do this and all the city employees went no we'll get shocked <laughs> <Right. laughs> <We're not doing laughs> you know? so they've gone you know i mean now and there's a lot of things like people will share a lot of things on facebook and they share a lot of things but they don't share everything they don't okay there's not enough room on the page to yeah. share all your thoughts and dreams and hopes and whatever you know people edit it out they only want you to see certain things about themselves sometimes it's all complaining sometimes it's all happy but whatever that's not real they want the real dirt they want to know what yeah. you think what's inside here you the know internet of and bodies 
<laughs> yeah. And so, you know, now what do they have the, the, the technology to, to stick a chip in and, and read my heart rate and well, tell you if, you know, how must, you react? It must be so wild for you to have researched this stuff 20 years ago and now just watching like over the last 20 years. I mean, clearly the people who are behind this have the power to literally develop the technologies to acquire the kind of data that they wanted to have back in 2000 and then the power to be able to manipulate the public into giving up all that data to participating in in you know in this communitarian universe that they want to create i could be crying every day if i let that happen you know it's yeah. very sad it's a sad thing but i found humor in it i became monty python <laughs> and started looking at it through monty python's right. eyes okay? good idea just, good idea it had to and start and, and i and then, you know, I know some really wicked smart people through the writing and on Facebook. And they have great senses of humor. And they just, they, they just, you know, they don't hold back. And I love that. That's been really helpful because in the beginning for the first, you know, I didn't even have comments on my blog. And I have over a thousand entries on my blog. And I finally met people, you know, started taking comments. And that's how I met my friend Jeff Boer and my friend Sean Alger. And there's a few really good long-term connections that I made. But for the most right. part, you know, I, I didn't care um, to have these discussions with people that weren't um, – paying attention that you know they would just wanted to attack me or say that i was reading too much into it and i'm like okay whatever i, I don't care what you think it's surprising <laughs> to me how people like they don't they don't quite get it like they you know they're listening to it i mean i have a friend uh and he kind of gets into it with me on facebook and i'll be talking about the world economic forum which is now the the big organization that's really promoting a lot of this communitarian concept and he'll be like, this is an innocuous economic plan. And, and you know, the, they still have to get implemented through the democratic process. And it's like, I'm trying to tell him like, no, you know, this is an authoritarian uh, belief system, you know, political philosophy, and it's being implemented behind the backs of the democratic process. It's not happening through the regular channels, the appropriate channels. It's not transparent. Uh, it's just so difficult for people to kind of grasp um, I don't know if they have a hard time thinking that really rich people can be manipulative or what, but but they really don't get it. You have to you have to be willing to look into it to figure it out. I have uh, several um, things written by Claus or um, yeah Schwab that, Klaus Schwab Schwab Klaus Schwab mm -hmm. calling it communitarianism. Mm -hmm. And I put that out there and, you know, a few people went, wow, that was it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So it, it just, there's something I, okay. You want to hear my, my real theory about this? I think Let's Etzioni is a magician. I think he's a high priest of an ancient cult. <laughs> and I think that they did something to the word. I think that they put some kind of hex on it. Right. And so when you hear the word, your eyes glaze over. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like in the beginning, the first like couple months, I kept calling it command humanitarianism. Yeah. Because it, it just, it wouldn't come out of my lips. And my daughter <laughs> went crazy. She's like, mom, it's communitarianism. I'm like, That's what I said. Communitarianism. <laughs> so, you know. Even for me, it was really hard. So, and I and people were like, "Well, it's a hard word." In fact, the Republican National Party, the Libertarian National Party headquarters, because I contacted all of them too. Okay, not the Democrats because they were all over this shit at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they were part of it. You know, they were openly part of it. Where the Republicans at the time, I thought might not be. I don't know, but they told me the word was too hard to pronounce for Americans. Oh really? <laughs> Can't and talk that's about that's why it. they didn't use it. That's what Ron Paul said. I'm wow. like, what? What? So what? Make <laughs> them learn it. They learn supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> right. You know, when they were little kids, <laughs> they're not that stupid. And it's the the assumption is that we're we're ignorant. 
you know, because we, our culture has so many variables and so many different people from so many different backgrounds. And really the best professions here are men's work that don't require college education. Sorry. You know, that's where the money is. That's where the, you know, your business owners, they don't need a BA in business to run a good business in this country. Yeah. No, you need drive, ambition and guts, you know, and, and a lot of really, uh, good things you know that make it happen so your core people the ones that are really been targeted under covid restrictions and lost all their businesses right they had they had to get rid of that class not the middle class the business owning class yeah because what is the business owning class a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds with a lot of different ideas but all of them in it for the bottom line which was to make money and feed their family yeah and they're independent yeah. Yes, independent and independent thinkers, they, and they don't have time for meetings. Right. That's what every, I told people all the time. I go, you know, all this shit is happening in these little stupid meetings with like twelve people in them. You need to go, and they're like, I don't have time for that. Right, and and you know, we don't have time for meetings. Who has time to go sit around and listen to a bunch of people <laughs> jaw about you know we're gonna make we're gonna put in a new sign at the entrance to the neighborhood so everybody knows where they are. And then half the room will go, okay, good, good luck with that, you know, yeah. and leave because who cares about yeah. your stupid sign? Oh, they're into signs and paths and designations and, you know, they're, they're, and then they control that path. Well, and, then, and, and it's so wild that this is how they've really managed to circumvent the constitution because they couldn't get, they couldn't get these ideas passed in Congress and they didn't really want them to see the light of day. So that there was a transparency and a debate process. And so it's like they went into the city governments and then they went into the bureaucracy part of it where nobody goes and nobody's watching. And then they slowly started to implement all of these policies that are really extremely controlling and really, uh, you know, chipping away at those individual rights, at, at the in, in individual's right to be a sovereign person and, and then using using this to implement this entire economic system that's really just designed to eliminate that business class like you're talking about and then in the very powerful are going to be able to take over and basically regentrify the entire city yeah exactly and a key doc is the administrative procedures act of 1946 lewis brandis is a really important significant participant in the communitarian takeover of our country. Hmm. And he was, um, he's the one that brought Zionism to the American Jews too, because Zionism didn't have any support from American Jews at all until Brandis. Okay. And I'm not sure if I say that his name, right, but um, the administrative procedures act is what I, <clears throat> what I was dealing with in Seattle, the communitarian law is embedded in administrative law. Okay. And so when you go into their court, you're not in a constitutional court, you're in an administrative court. In Seattle, we were the, the law was written by the agency. The law was enforced by the agency. If you appeal the fine, because it's always about fines and eventual property taking, hmm. you go before an agency judge. <laughs> so, I, so when I started looking at that, I'm like, okay, so you wrote the law, you enforced the law, and you j judged right. me on the law. <laughs> oh, I don't want. I want out of this court. Okay, <laughs> I want to be in a constant. So I'm in a con. I'm in an administrative court, claiming rights that they're like they're doing this. <laughs> you know, because none of that shit applies. Yeah. And and you're and that whole thing you can't fight city hall. Well, this is why, you know municipalities don't have any power in your constitution. There's nothing in your constitution, your state constitution or your federal constitution that says the city has all the power. No. Okay. The cities took their power from, a, from the communitarians and built on it. This goes way back. Yeah. U S mayor's association, another key organization. Okay. And they all get together regularly and plan how they, the, why are all these same programs being implemented in cities across the, the country? Because your mayor went to this meeting 
And, you know, didn't tell you about it. This was the whole Ickley thing that um, people started getting onto that after a while that um, there were um, organizations that were working to undermine the Constitution in uh, local affairs Mm -hmm. through these other organizations. So um, it it, it has taken, from what I can tell, over 100 years to wear it down to the point where we would accept the big solution. And that's a big part of their theory too. This is that Hegelian piece of it, constant conflict going back and forth and right. never gets resolved. And, you know, we, you know, people just get tired of the argument and tired of everything and say, well, let's just come up with something that everybody can agree with right now and be done with it. Cause that's a pragmatic American too. There's in, in Europe, um, in the 1800s, in the mid 1800s, Americans were called Yankee apes. <laughs> yep. And that is how they see us, okay? It, it, and when you, it, it, I, I was insulted at first when I would read these things and I'd go, who wrote this shit about us? This is so horrible. Well, that's how they've always seen us. Because I think what happened here, another theory that I have besides it's only being a high priest in the right. alchemist organization you know, <laughs> is that the constitution was set up for them. I don't trust Jefferson. I don't trust any of those boys. Um, but the bill of rights was imposed on the framers by the individual States who refused to ratify the constitution without a federal bill of rights. Yeah. And the arguments over the bill of rights are fascinating what little i could uh, gain access to and so i think that that's why they've just had to pound away at the bill of rights for a hundred years because that's the glitch in their whole program if we was it was constitutional inside the constitution is the executive privilege boom everything could be gone except for that little glitch called you know the first amendment second (laughs) yeah a thorn in their side the rest of them well, and yeah. I wanted I wanted to get into this history with you because I think it's really fascinating and it's so different from the way, of course, that we're all taught history, but that there, there was the American Revolution and that basically, you know, the aristocrats of Europe were always trying to get back the power over the United States. I mean, from, from day one, like the American Revolution didn't end. And one of the ways that I think that they did that because, and, and you talk a lot about this history in the books where you know, the, the, the constitution is based on this idea of private property and individual sovereignty. And as soon as that document was written, as soon as those 10 amendments were written, the aristocracy is like, how are we going to get around this? You know, we've got to find a political philosophy that's different from, from this. And this comes from guys like John Locke that were writing and they were fighting the empire. They were fighting the feudal system and the British empire. And so what happens, these rich guys start to fund this guy named Frederick Hegel. And he writes a, a, a whole different political philosophy about, you know, these l- huge historical movements that are that are just predefined, preordained by God. And then Marx at, just kind of turns it into the materialist dialectic, where it's all just preordained by science, basically. Um, but it's the same concept that instead of having individual freedoms and, and then the societies that naturally evolve based on individual choices we're so suddenly we're, we're back as a part of this huge long historical movement based on these conflicts between the the thesis and then the antithesis and then the synthesis and and we've had since that whole time we've had this political philosophy completely dominating the academic landscape the way even the republican and the democratic parties are based on the hegelian dialectic and the conflict between the two and none of it's based on individual sovereignty or individual rights um and instead, it's like the Republicans are, are on the corporate side, and, and the corporations came from straight out of fe- feudal Europe, and the Democrats are on the socialist, quote unquote, the workers side, but that comes straight out of the feudal, the aristocrats that were funding Hegel and Marx to write this stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and now those same aristocrats are creating, and you, you kind of alluded to it before, the third way, which is what they're describing as communitarianism, which is supposed to be the th- the synthesis of the two. 
And it really is just this long, I, I feel like it's this long period of time where the aristocracy has been just continuously since that point of the of the American Revolution and maybe even uh, the, the British Revolution in what 1688, uh, yeah. when Parliament was formed, um, they've been trying to get the power back. The Dutch back. had a Bill of Rights in the 1500s. Hmm. Yeah, yep. the, the one one of the things I found fascinating that was by 1824, I think it was, almost every place, every colony, and every nation in the world had copied the American Declaration of Independence and declared their own. Right. I was, was like, wow. They really? must not have been happy with that. The kings no. of Europe were not happy about this. So yeah. This is 20 <laughs> years later, you got marks. Okay. Yeah. And so I, I, so I see it as a, as a, well, there's two views of history. There's the coincidental and then there's the conspiratorial. Yeah. <laughs> I am totally a follower of the conspiratorial. Right. Because when you look at the events and how they laid out, when the, when the Americans solidified their individual sovereignty through their Bill of Rights, it shut down a whole mess of things. <clears throat> and it empowered your the common man for the mm -hmm. first time in the history of the world that I can see. The common man was like, this is my property. You get the hell out of here. I don't care who you are. You couldn't quarter your soldiers in their houses. You couldn't. You, it, it, the, the governments, uh, and all governments have passed, could just come and take all your shit whenever they wanted. Right. They could take you and throw you out in the street and take your house for whatever reason. So, and also, and if you didn't have money and you weren't a landowner, you know, then you had nothing. So the American Declaration em empowered everyone and, 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 and literally every group that came here, when the Germans came, they had to fight for it. The Irish really had to fight for it. Yeah. The blacks are still fighting for it. Right. The Mexicans, they, they're, they're going to fight for it. Every, everybody that comes here, you don't just get them. It, the rights don't just apply to you. You have to take them and say, those are mine. I live here now. I'm an American. And some of the best people that were fighting the communitarian takeover in Seattle were from Asia hmm. and the Middle East because they had left totalitarian dictatorship type, you know, communist countries. Yeah. And the first taste of freedom they had, they weren't giving it up. Right. And they actually knew the difference, you know, they so... I, I had allies in, that I that I couldn't even speak the same languages, but we all knew what was going on in a way that your Americans who just were actually brainwashed into thinking there was just a bunch of old white guys that you know wrote these like it's really outdated, the outdated constitution. Yeah, yeah. Nobody really believes in that anymore. And and this this um it's, it's this ease of discounting it. Because I was told in Seattle, I go, well, I defend property rights. And people were like, property rights are so outdated. Yeah. That man owns too many houses, don't you think? Why should one person be able to own so many houses? And I said, because he, he worked his ass off to, for that. You know, <laughs> I mean, there, there's no respect anymore for the work ethic either. Yeah. Because people, you know, not everyone achieves riches through their work ethic. But people who have a strong work ethic always seem to have a little bit more, don't they? You know, if, they, if you don't give up, you keep going. And I mean, and look, at, look at the people that get knocked down like me. I got knocked off my horse so many times. I've gone homeless through this. I've had all kinds of shit happen to me. And, you know, and I feel like quitting every time, okay? <laughs> it's not <laughs> like I go, oh, right. I go, oh, man, I'm done. <laughs> Right. fighting this war and then then here i am you know I, it's like you can't give up because it's it's real life it's real in your face and then yeah when 2020 happened oh my god because last year in 2019 i was like you know what we're almost at 2020 and i don't see it happening the way that they said it was going to happen maybe i was wrong wouldn't that be cool you know if i was totally wrong and None of that stuff was going to happen. And then, right. man, I started watching it happen. I Actually, I was stunned for a couple of months. Last March and April, I just kept going, oh, no. It, oh, no. 
Yeah, it's very so think- mafia-like and it's very cult-like. I, I mean, it's so many of these threads all come together. Um, the way they do it in secret, I was going to, I think we're running out, out towards the end of the interview here, but I was going to talk a little bit about the Fabian Society because these guys have been working in academics behind the scenes for a hundred years now, more than a hundred years to, to make these ideas happen, but without it ever happening in the forefront, always, you know, a few academics writing books, getting paid by the upper classes uh, to continue to formulate this stuff. All and then they, they the quote scene. each other and they promote each other so that these books become like, like Etzioni right. is called one of the top hundred intellectuals in the United States. Yeah. Nobody's ever heard of him. But he's one of the top hundred intellectuals here, and he's not an intellectual. People have blasted him. Uh, other people, way better than me, have gone after him at certain times and just trashed his arguments. Like it's easy. Yeah. So who's calling him the top intellectual? Yeah. Then they promote each other. They promote each other's books, and then by the time it gets to you, the common man. Cause I don't believe in the common good, but I believe in the common man. He says, I never heard of none of that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. What are you, what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> and then they're made to feel stupid. That's the goal right there. And if you feel stupid, then you won't fight back because you're confused. It's confusion. Right. So, you know, that was another thing with our work was just to empower people. To, yeah. Be stupid. Own your stupidity. You know, <laughs> that's the best part about it, you know? <laughs> and and that didn't work very good because nobody wants to. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's kind of where maybe we could wrap it up here is just to have a conversation because it's so frustrating to try to figure out how to fight back against this. Um, I mean, these guys are so well funded, it's over the top. And then they it's like we were just talking about, then they just they quote each other and they and they have each other's backs and then they get funded by the billionaire class and by the these empire builders. And then there's people like us living in our yurts, you know, <laughs> who are aware of what's going on, but we're in trying to kind of wake people up and, and most people are just working too hard, you know, they're working every day paying their bills and they don't want to educate themselves about this i mean where do you see this information overload and that's the other thing too much yeah it's hard to describe i I saw a meme the other day like somebody was asking does anybody has anybody ever been asked a question where you knew the answer but the answer meant having to like rewire somebody else's entire understanding of history (laughs) in order to be able to give you give them the answer and it just it was never going to happen i was like yeah i know what that feels like (laughs) yeah every time i very rarely would do it but every now and then i'd see someone asking all these questions it seems like there's a a common thread here. It seems like there's an overarching philosophy, but I just can't identify it. And I would jump in and go, it's called communitarianism. Yeah. And nine out of 10 times I'd hear, Oh, Nikki Rapana, you and your little communitarianism thing, you know? (laughs) And I go, okay. You know, I go away because I'm not there. I, I don't like arguing. I like debate kind of you know i mean that i can do Mm -hmm. but arguing for arguing's sake no you know i and and i didn't want to argue with the the government officials i didn't argue with them i just asked questions Mm. and i had a thing where i said ask you stupid questions i really i was going to actually have a banner (laughs) outside my house and said they're the right ones to ask so if you have a question ask it and if somebody can't answer it or they give you some roundabout answer that doesn't quite answer your question. That's a clue. Yeah. That's right the red there. flag. Yeah. That's the red flag, especially if it's in a revision of your land use plan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't know. Cause ours was all about quality of life. And I was like, so what does that mean? And they go, well, what do you mean? I go, quality of life. What does that mean? It's in the law. We, you know, and and it's the mission statement of the Seattle Police Department was to increase quality of life. Mm. What does that mean? Because, you know, right now I thought my quality of life was okay. <laughs> so yours must be different than mine. And then th- their answer to that was it's a livability issue. Huh. Which is another word they couldn't define. <laughs> 
Right. None of those words. And when I finally got the Department of Neighborhoods to answer, they said, oh, we don't have definitions for any of those. That took me two years to get that letter <laughs> out of them because I just would not stop. They finally just admitted we don't have them. So don't let anybody write a law that they can't define every term in that law. That would be a, a good start too, you know, yeah. look at the law, you know, and, and, and th this is the problem. Though, you know, a lot, I have a lot of friends that are not that literate. Okay. So over the years, you know, they'll, they're always asking me to read stuff for them and tell them what's in it. So there, there are people like me that will do that for their neighbors. You know, so if you're not the, the literate one, that's okay too. Doesn't mean you don't know what's going on or got a good yeah. feeling on something or that you have a, a role to play in this. It just means that you got to find somebody in your group, maybe your kid, you know? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Someone to read that and then help you figure it out because there is it, it it's it's a war on words. It's a game that they're playing. They change the meanings of the words and then they use the words that you think that you know what community means. I mean, I thought I was in the community. Every time they said, this is what the community wants. And I was like, well, I, no, not everybody in, in the community wants it. Yeah. And so to find out that, that, that we're not even in that definition was key for me. You know, So that word doesn't mean what it means to most people. Community law doesn't mean any of that either, you know, because it is community law. So I think that, you know, for what people, what can you do is, you know, is right in front of you. It's what you can see, what you can touch, the people that you can talk to in your immediate vicinity, you know. It's local. And that's so boring. Isn't it just more fun to go after the globalists who you can never touch, <laughs> yeah. never see, you know. No, the work to be done is right in your front yard practically. And it's going to come to your front yard in the form of a land use plan. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And there will be government agents and they will assume certain powers and they will have a law that they pass that legitimizes whatever it is they're doing so um you know <clears throat> that's that's the only way that i know yeah okay yeah, it, it sounds like a plan that's the revolution right there showing up to your local land use meeting and ask as many stupid questions as you can and get as, as can, many except, people yes. to do that as possible and I then the, after a while they'll just say okay whatever we give no, up <laughs> and then if, if you if you bring enough people with you you can nominate yourself and start a committee. Say, because right. you can't like take over the maybe the president position, but you can say, I I think we need a committee to a committee called um, assessment of definitions of terms <laughs> used. I, I nominate me to be the president or the leader of the team, you know, and then you have your people in the room and say, I second the motion, you know, hey, right. use Robert rules of order because they never do, you know, and then suddenly you have a, uh, like every meeting I went to when they would say, we need volunteers to help close out the such and such project. I'd say, I volunteer. And they'd all laugh because <laughs> they never wanted me on any of their committees, yeah. you know, yeah. but I I've been to some of those meetings. I was there. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I've been that yeah, guy. Too. I'm in. I'm in, you say. And then yeah. they go, oh no, you know, because they don't know what to do with you. Well, now they have more skills. They've learned the Delphi technique a lot better. You know, they got, they got their methods down, yeah. but nothing beats stubbornness. They can't deal with stubborn, <laughs> you know, because that's what I was. You know, they, they told me I, I was stubborn and I said, yep, I am. You know, <laughs> I asked one question and I'm two years later still trying to get an answer. Yeah. What's and that's your that? job. What's up with that? Yeah. And they were like, oh, we just, I had so many exasperated public servants go, me. I just don't know what you want from me. And I go, answers to things that you're doing. If you just give me the answers, I'll go away. Because they kept sending me to other departments. Big mistake. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because I made friends with the receptionists in every department. I made friends with the secretaries on the outside. Yeah. You know? I did. They're the ones that started slipping me papers on the side. Hey, there's a meeting going on down the hall. You should probably be there, don't you think? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, you got a lot of allies that you don't even know you have and other common people, mm -hmm. commoners, you know. It's if anything, it's a it's a it's a that whole word common is the good word. 
not the, but not the common good. Like I said, it's the common man or the common people. Yeah, you know, and take back that power, not the collective. No, the individual commoners that have you know the heart and soul of this yeah. country. That's that's take- that's who we got. And you, Ireland's got them. Scotland's got them. England's got them. Right. They're all over the place. Got, you know, they're all over <laughs> everywhere the place. you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and they got to yeah. go to those meetings and they got to ask the stupid questions and that's how to stop it. <laughs> and that's how to stop it. Isn't that something? It yeah. really, I mean, yeah, you could, I don't know if you could stop it, but you can waylay it until you figure out a better right. plan maybe along right. the way. You, we bought time in Seattle. Their whole, they changed everything down there. Yeah. Based on just me. There's, and my big mouth. There's so much truth to that. I know, like you were saying, that so many of us, you know, we want to fight the globalists, you know, and find the 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 evil leader who, you know, we can destroy the emperor or whatever. And it, it really, like, exactly what you're saying is actually the way to go. You've got to go to your local county board meeting and you've got to throw the wrench in the gears and you've got to ask those questions because they won't have answers and they won't have definitions for what they're saying when they're talking about the common good and and the community you know wellness program and the 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 uh, quality of life issues well what is that what is that what is that that you're talking about they don't have the answer because it's all just smoke and mirrors for this control grid and so yeah. we go there we ask those questions and yeah, I mean, what a great way to to like throw that monkey wrench, um, and, and have a lot of fun doing it, you right? Know, and go <laughs> the words, and you know, this is how you get to know your neighbors, and that's on a level that these are the people that you might want to trade with after they right. control all the trade. It, yeah, Who I mean, that's how trust? they right. That's how they took control, right? Global to local, they took control in your in that local meeting because they didn't mm-hmm. think anybody was going to show up. So if you want to take it back, you got to go to the meeting and you got to be the one to 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 take it back from the bureaucracy, from the bureaucrats that are just going to implement this stuff uh, if nobody stands up to it. So. Great advice, Nikki. I, I hope we inspire uh, millions of people <laughs> to go to their local <laughs> land use planning board meeting. <laughs> well, no, your community council. Yeah. Their neighborhood councils, community councils, and then they have like then they have all these subcommittees, the trails committee, the the roads committee, the safety committee, the neighborhood right. watch committee. I am neighborhood watch, you know, because I I, I hate that whole concept of that so what do i do i become it and then i do it my way hi Grandma. hi hey sweetie. you want to say <laughs> hi go over here come over here with your cute little hat on this is why we do it this this is ted hey my man he's the future are you the future i have a bit i have a bit on my hat you do yeah, you do bird, huh? <laughs> yeah and it's from mini four Mini four, yes, mini four. Cool. <laughs> okay, it, it looks right, great so on you. Bye. You wear it well. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> okay, go with Tomas. <laughs> I'm done. There we go. He just said, "I talked to a really nice guy." <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> and that's why we do it. It makes it all worth it, Nikki. <laughs> yes, it does. All right. You you want to let people know where uh, maybe where they can find out more about this about your stuff? Get a, get their hands on on your book. Do you uh, have? We we put the PDF out for free. Mm-hmm. I'll put a link to the, that. You can download the ebook, and that's right under my name on Facebook. I put the link. Okay. Um, oh, like the bio where it says who I am or whatever. It just it just the link to the free ebook, and um, you know people were we had a lot of people. Uh, take it and republish it over the years and stuff and and we we ran out of hard copies like so early and we couldn't go back to print because stuff happened and we you know anyway the book if you have a hard copy you got one of the yeah, few you know right. <laughs> and so we we've been trying to get it back together but then every we want to update it and, re- and revise it because so much new information comes to light oh yeah. you know that we haven't uh and so now nordica wants me to do a complete update which then we decided we weren't going to do any up i mean we just can't make up our minds because we're not 
this is such uncharted territory, what we've done here and what to do with this book. And then, you know, we kind of didn't like all the attention that we got and the, it was scary. Sure. A lot of strange things happened. A lot of strange people came to visit. A lot of strange, you know, I didn't, I'm not interested in that strange world, you know, yeah, the arena so is creepy. It's a creepy arena. And, um, and so, you know, I, at least I'm, I'm more prepared for it now, you know, but I even do, I do a book tour. I don't, I don't feel good traveling at all anymore. I haven't since 9-11. So, you know, as far as like promoting anything, it, it, you don't even need to sell it, you know, just give it away. Right. I can't give away hard copies, but definitely the ebook. And then uh, there's tools in the back. I have uh, in the appendix, me, we put a me. whole bunch of things in there. That uh, people can do. Well, everything we just talked about is yeah. in there too. So I would encourage Grandma? people to put it in your bathroom. Grandma. You know, print it up. It's 326 pages, so it's going to cost some ink. But once you got it, you know, and then take your time and digest it slowly because it's, it's there's a lot in there, a lot that will confront any uh, ideas that you had about what you thought you knew. Um, it certainly did for me, you know, and and use it as a tool to uh you know take your power back uh -huh. is there a, a website or a blog or should i just point people to the facebook page well there's nothing current on my blog my blog is nikki rapana.blogspot.com and i can't get to it because i lost my google password for my old account but there's about a thousand articles and and just posts and then the website the research was at nord dot tw dot net forward slash acl and now it just looks like a book company it has a couple little things on it right nordica, nordica took all the research and put it on different addresses so all of the um we've got a lot of dead links 404 errors now but wayback machine has a lot of everything uh -oh. that i ever did is on there uh -oh, so cool um, I might go back in through that someday and, and try to publish it or, or repost it on another website. So um, it's a lot of work. And I, 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 I gave it all my heart and soul, you know, for all those years. And then when I stopped, it's like I couldn't go back to it. It just was too hard. To, you know, it's hard to get your head around this. And now it's in my face every day. It's like I went to Facebook to have fun, okay? Uh, right. <laughs> just talk to people and stuff. And, <laughs> Oh no, you know, Not these and, I days. Made all, and I made all these new friends that I just, I'm so grateful, you know, because the, um, a lot of my old friends that are, are coming around now that have been probably calling me a crazy person for a long time, aren't calling me crazy now. Yeah, I believe that. I believe. And, sure. and then new friends that are bringing so much more information to me and validating me in different ways that I never even thought about. And I don't know anything about AI or, you know, the the whole smart grid thing. I'm not up on that, you know, on the electronic stuff. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure glad I'm off grid. I'll tell you that. Yeah, you know, I, hear, I hear you there too. Made made some good choices that didn't seem like good choices. Like a few years ago, I was in that case from living off grid. Now I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> when they when they won't let you go to the grocery store or use your bank account, <laughs> you'll be all right. <laughs> No, I won't. I'll be just as screwed as everybody else. <laughs> well, get that. But they won't going. be able to. Sh they won't be able to shut off my lights. And if they, if, if my lights go out, I got candles and batteries. Yeah, and flashlights. Okay, <laughs> so that I won't be. <laughs> but as far as get, getting to the, I want the stores to remain open. Yeah. I want trade to continue, because no, I won't function without it. I, I, all this whole self sufficiency thing. That's a load of crap if you ask me okay it really is it most takes people a, it takes a real community <laughs> yeah yes it does and not yeah. everybody can make everything you can't make everything i mean yeah. unless you're like i don't know some people are super people and they're they, you know been doing it for a long time but you can't if you're going to start it now like i'm not a farmer i don't have farm animals i'm thinking about getting a chicken <laughs> yeah. you know just like yeah. a laying hand or something like that but even that i'm I like know. oh i don't know where we're gonna put it i gotta figure this out so it's it's a huge insurmountable task for most of us to even think that way i think i'd rather you know uh 
go back to some kind of a political economy situation where we're only buying locally, mm-hmm. that would help a lot. If you just stopped going to these cheap stores and buying all their cheap corporate made goods, right? then, you know, that would be a huge impact too, but nobody's going to do that because who's if you're always trying to save money. I went to Walmart myself and bought a dog cage because I that know. was the only place that had them. So it, you can't not go to those stores at some point. And um, so I don't think that that is, is feasible. And if I have to get a chip to purchase goods from a store, well, then that's it for me. Okay. Because I'm not getting any kind of a chip. <laughs> but then, yeah, I'm there with you. Who, you know, that's a sacrifice that someone might feel like they can make for their family. Like maybe one member of every family gets a chip or gets the vax so that they can function in the world so that they can protect the rest of the people. I mean, I thought about that. Okay. Yeah. About how people are going to have to really uh, pull together and make sacrifices that they would never have considered important and i started thinking well i'm the old person here i'm gonna die soon anyway maybe it should be me you know so that these children don't have to go through that yeah but we're not there yet but we will be next year it's happening fast so a lot of choices that got to be made are and they're personal choices they're not we're not going to share what we decide with anybody you know i my advice to people would be stop telling people what you have if you have a stash or what you're doing all these survival groups that i'm in and living off grid and stuff and people put up all these pictures here's all my wood supply here's all my food supply oh my god what are you doing yeah. you know <laughs> you don't want to tell everybody what you got it's starting to be a lot more um close to your you know, keep things tight, loose lips, sink ships, and all, all that mm-hmm. is, is really kind of important right now, too. You know, share your happy time, share your, you know, whatever, but, you know, what you're really doing, what you're really thinking, you know, keep that within your, your circle. Right. But my circle got really big, and I'm really glad about that, you know, that I feel like I have connected with people all over the world who think that they have a right to exist. You know, and that's the only thing they really have in common, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> which means that I have a right to exist too, you know, as who I am, you know, with all my flaws and character defects and, you know, all my problems and my stupid history or whatever. None of that shit matters. What matters is that, you know, I'm me. And that's the, that's what individual sovereignty is. That's This is my property. This is what I did with it for better or worse. This is it. Yeah. This is what you you get what you get, and and to be happy with that, and and go forward from that perspective instead of what you owe or you're less than or you know you're fighting the crowd. You know I don't want to fight the crowd. I want to hang with the people that don't want to fight the crowd either. <laughs> you know what I mean? That want to eat though. You know and and you know what I'm saying here. Yeah. You know I'm sure California's got some some way better options too because you know there's it's nicer down there so not it's going to so be cold. You know, not quite so cold there's more you know the, you know almonds down in chico i mean there's you know there's food available more farms and stuff so right now i mean i'd say you know your best friend is the farmer down the street you know yeah, really and and the guy that maybe makes, knows how to sew leather or you know those kind of things yeah i see that happening too so there is hope. We're not in Milton's hell yet. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I like it. I mean, the, the answer to communitarianism is really having a real community that really functions uh, to get the goods, goods and services that we all need to have that localized economy that, we, that we're <laughs> looking like we're going to need here probably sooner rather than later. So. That sounds yeah. Sounds let me like know. You know, contact me if you got something going. Um, you know, I I like to know um, where I can buy shit. Yeah, <laughs> sounds <laughs> sounds good. Yeah. All right, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a second and just let everybody know they've been listening to the shift, and I've been your host Doug McKinty. You can find uh, all of my stuff. I, I'm pointing people to the website as much as possible these days because uh, the social media censorship is so gnarly and just navigating all the Mm -hmm. social media sites uh, is a pain. So if you really want to get connected, go to www.theshiftnow.com and sign up for the newsletter. 
the pop-up will just come up uh, after a few seconds and then I will email you everything that I get, everything that I produce out of the studios here. I've been pretty busy um, making a couple of different shows uh, behind the line, the psychology of lockdown, the shift. And I think I'm going to start a, a new show here next week with my, my new friend, Jason Bosch. So I'm looking forward to getting that started um, and having an, a great conversation. You are a busy guy. Yeah. It's all about making content these days. And this is what I'm doing. I mean, you got to fight, I fight the man somehow, right? I'm getting the help, trying yeah. to help get the word out. So um, I'm trying to get out as much stuff as I can. And I have a great time having these conversations. So it's not so bad. Could be a lot worse. <laughs> all right, everybody have a great day. Thanks for listening. And thanks, Nikki, for all the work that you've done. I really appreciate it. I know it can be a lonely road looking into looking into all this crazy stuff and then the hard to find people that even will listen to what you're talking about. But I think, uh, I think more and more people are waking up these days and, um, the work that you've done to uh, let people know about communitarianism and what it is. And it's kind of, it's just, it's that concept is the glue that holds all this other stuff together that we're always talking about the technocracy, the, the internet of things, the internet of bodies, the smart cities, the smart growth, uh, you know, everything that, um, is happening with the world economic forum and the great reset the this idea of communitarianism is behind it all so really important work that you've done and thanks for coming on the show and letting my my audience know about it well you know thanks for having me for sure have a great day we'll we'll keep it okay <laughs> take care yeah we will all right and there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That was my conversation with Nikki Rapina about communitarianism. Uh, like I said in the introduction, this is such a huge concept and so important because it's the glue that fits all the puzzle pieces of The Great Reset together. I'm thinking about all the different interviews I've done with Patrick Wood, with Allison McDowell, with Rosa Corey, uh, and many others where we've been discussing bits and pieces of this. But all of those issues, uh, social impact investing, uh, Agenda 21, the, the concept of the Great Reset and technocracy in general, none of these would be happening without the background philosophy of communitarianism as the central driving force. It's what they all have in common, uh, and it's the philosophy that they all use to justify their existence as they march forward with uh, these plans. Um, one of the things we didn't get a chance to talk about in in the interview that I wanted to get to, so I'll just mention it now, is how it was the Fabian Socialist Movement that's really been implementing these things behind the scenes. People are always talking about how, oh, you know, no billionaire class has this much control. They can't be doing this from behind the scenes. We have these democratic processes. And so, you know, these, these are just different uh, economic ideas, economic plans that are being promoted. And then people are debating these and, and life progresses in this great free society that we have and that's just actually not the case and how they've managed to uh, implement communitarianism over the last hundred years I think in a large part has to do with the Fabian Society and the way that those guys decided they were going to implement socialism not through a, a, a communist revolution the way that Marx described but slowly over time, and they've done this by infiltrating just the academic class. So you've got this guy, Amitai Etzioni, who's been writing books about communitarianism since the 1950s, and a lot of academics just get turned on to this, and a lot of these people in, in, this, in this particular group, this particular class, the elite foundations, the, the corporations, the think tanks, these are the people, and of course the universities uh, around the country, around the world, these are the people who are reading his books, these are the people who are formulating these plans, and then uh, what they have done, and there are a variety of different foundations and other organizations, uh, non-NGOs, non-governmental organizations that picked up on this idea, they would come up with these neighborhood plans, these city plans, and they approach the cities one by one. Uh, because by approaching the cities, they don't have to go through uh, you know, the bother of things like the U.S. Constitution or the state constitutions that, that um, provide these individual rights very specifically specifically, but cities have more power. City governments have more power because of things like, um, you know, the idea of urban blight and the permitting processes and the zoning laws actually kind of give them a, a lot more leeway to sort of 
push on the idea of individual rights or individual liberties. So they go to the cities, and in these in these city bureaucracies, they implement these these larger plans, this global agenda. Uh, and the city governments are happy. Somebody's given them a, a nice package, a great plan. They typically come with a, a huge grant, by the way, that helps them implement. So they get it funded. They get the plan, the package. They don't have to build these things themselves. People come in. They go to a couple of these you know, board meetings, city planning meetings behind the scenes. Maybe there's a few citizens there, you know. But uh, most of us don't even know about any of these kinds of goings on. And all of a sudden, the plans are starting to get implemented slowly over time, over time. And like Nikki has just got turned on to this in the late 1990s and have just watched as everything that she predicted, everything that she saw going on 20 years ago, continued to build and build and build until what we're seeing now, which is this great reset, right? The, the total implementation of these uh, of these plans that have been being created and built since the 1950s and even prior to that with the Fabian Socialist Movement and, and uh, the technocratic movement in the 1930s, etc. But this is now the culmination of the Vision 2020 that she was reading a lot about back in 2000. Um, so fascinating for her to really be able to see, of course, She's been right all along. This happens to all of us who really do the research, who really see uh, the corporations and the think tanks and are reading the white papers and know what's going on. Uh, we're seeing the implementation of a lot of this right now. Another thing that we really didn't get a chance to talk about, there's just, it's such a huge topic, so I'll fill you in some of the gaps, but uh, they call communitarianism the third way, and it's built all on this uh, idea of the dialectic, the dialectical thinking. So in Hegel's thought, uh, Hegel started with this idea of the, of the historical dialectic, uh, where you went from feudalism to uh, representative democracy was the new thesis, the antithesis to that. Uh, then Marx came along, said the antithesis to that is uh, communism, and then the synthesis of this representative democracy and communism now, according to the communitarianism, uh, the communitarianists is, is communitarianism. This is the synthesis, the third way they call it, uh, the next level of the Hegelian dialectic, which will create theoretically Hegel's. Finally, they'll they'll discover Hegel, what he called the end of history, because uh, what human reason will will end uh, all necessary uh, processes of evolution. And uh, we will have reached the end of history where the, <laughs> I think where the singularity will have occurred and we'll all just be plugged into the AI and we'll be living in the virtual world. So complete, uh, finally completely severed from all natural processes. <laughs> and that's my own take on it. I'm not a very big fan of, of Hegel's and, and neither is Nikki. Um, but, um, you know, just to understand how that whole concept of, of the Hegelian dialectic uh, comes into play, I'm actually starting a new show uh, with Jason Bosch, and I think one of the premises of the show is to figure out how to just get away from this dialectical thinking altogether and starting to develop a different political philosophy. Uh, I mean, let's just toss this thing in the garbage bin of history. It's been used um, by imperialists now for almost 200 years uh, to justify all manner of control. And uh, we, the people, need to stop thinking that you know, the Republicans are, are the, the, the uh, thesis and the Democrats are the, are the antithesis and we need, we, we, com we uh, compromise into this third way, <laughs> right, of communitarianism because this is, uh, this is all part of the rich guy's plan, I think, and just learning, uh, only understanding how to think in terms of left versus right uh, and this Hegelian dialectic in terms of, of how we help other people People, how we engage in political activity, how we work within our communities. Um, it's not working out for us, folks. Uh, it's working out for those guys at the top. And another thing that, um, that Nikki brought up in the books uh, was that uh, Hegelianism itself, and then later the socialism and the, and the, and the uh, communism, and then later the communitarianism, has always been heavily funded by the upper classes. Uh, and it was a political philosophy intended to counteract uh, those philosophies of individual liberty 
uh, the, the philosophies of people like John Locke or like Thomas Paine, uh, who really helped build the ideas of individual rights, uh, that individuals should be allowed to make choices for themselves. Um, and, you know, after the American Revolution, these ideas became very popular. There were multiple revolutions all over the world as people began to rise up against the empire and demand individual rights. Well, the empire builders needed a new philosophy, you know, to keep this from happening in order to maintain control uh, and in order to keep profiting off of the labor of uh, all of the different places that they colonize now all over the world. Uh, and so this dialectical thinking was, a, was the perfect uh, way to waylay people. Uh, stop thinking about individual rights. Start thinking that you're just part of some long historical cycle that's predetermined uh, to result in the total control and centralization uh, of all good services and resources <laughs> into the hands of the few. And of course, they've never said the hands of the few, uh, you know, the, the few who control the authority or whatever. They always describe it in terms of uh, the community. It's the community that's going to do it. It's the commune. It's the people. The people will collectively own it. But of course... Somebody's got to make the decisions as to how to use it and who gets what. And, uh, you know, I think whenever you centralize uh, power, control, and, and resources, clearly there's going to be an upper class that, that, uh, that determines who gets what. Um, and so this dialectical thinking was a way to, I think, really snooker the bulk of the population into thinking that that communist or communitarian revolution will be right around the corner. Uh, and, oh, by the way, we don't care about these individual rights for people to choose um, because if the community owned everything, then we'd all get the, the free pharmaceutical health care, right? <laughs> um, and we'd all get uh, the free uh, schooling that uh, the people at the Ford Foundation or the Rockefeller Foundation really believe that, that we all should get. It's not up to our parents. It's not something that we're going to organize within our own community. Um, and this gets into the idea of positive and negative rights uh, that Nikki talked about a little bit. Uh, and, then, and then just one last thing. Just to fill in the gaps, I mean, one of the most fascinating things I think that really trips us all up in our political conversations that we have now that she touched on in the books is this idea that the free market is really quite the opposite of a corporatism or imperialism, right? And so many of us in the modern age, because we've been tripped up into this dialectical thinking and we're not any longer focused on the principles of individual rights uh, and individual freedoms. Uh, I think people get imperialism and free markets uh, confused over and over again uh, that this was done purposely. Again, they wanted to get this idea, get the idea of individual rights out of our heads because it was succeeding in taking the power back from the empire and from the colonizing forces. And, uh, and they wanted to be able to get this idea into our heads that uh, uh, the the corporations, of course, which are the institutions that are run by the empire builders and the, and the colonizers uh, in order to control the resources to um, solidify the means of production into the hands of the few. Uh, the corporations became, in many people's minds, uh, this idea of, of what a free market is. Um, in fact, the people who have fought for hundreds of years uh, for individual liberties have always been fighting the corporate system uh, and uh, fighting for the rights of all the little guys to be able to start their own businesses, to be able to do their own thing, to be able to make choices for themselves. Uh, so it gets to a place where the important thing is to choose the kind of health care that you want and to be able to choose the kind of education that you want, not to be given the kind of education the authorities want to give you for free or be given the kind of health care that the authorities want to give you uh, for free, quote unquote. Of course, those same authorities uh, are getting paid the big bucks to give you the kind of health care that they want us to have or the kind of education that they want us to have so that uh, they, of course, control our health, uh, control our thoughts, control our thinking. And as we get deeper into the whole technocratic movement, um, we're going to see more and more and more of that uh, with the technology that they have now. They're really going to be able to get inside our heads. So um, great conversation with Nikki. 
about communitarianism. It is, uh, again, the foundational ideas behind a lot of what's happening today, so it's well worth your time to look into it. You can find her work at www.nikkirapina.blogspot.com. Uh, I was looking at it, it looks like she kind of stopped writing a lot on the, on the blog there uh, about 2015, so you can find older stuff there, or you can just look up Nikki Rapina on Facebook and get in touch with her. She's uh, pretty active there to this day, and uh, on her Facebook page, she's got the link uh, to the book, and I'll also put the link underneath in the show notes, so if you want to check that out, then you can. They've got a really good bit in there, actually, about the Hegelian dialectics, so... Um, I urge everybody to check that out. And I'll just let you all know, as usual, you can go to www.theshiftnow.com and find out more about me and my work. I've got a lot of new stuff coming out now. I'm doing Behind the Line. I'm doing uh, the Psychology of Lockdown series. Of course, I've got uh, all the free episodes of The Shift up there. Uh, And again, starting this new uh, political and economics, we're going to talk a lot of monetary theory, I think, me and Jason. We're going to do our first one tomorrow. It'll just be a conversation with me and him talking, and then hopefully we'll keep it rolling and have a lot of good and interesting guests again with the idea of uh, really um, fleshing out, actually, probably these ideas that I talked about with Nikki and communitarianism. Uh, what is the Hegelian dialectic? <coughs> and um, what are some ideas that we can come up with to replace this? We, I think we really need a unifying political philosophy that's some, something that we can all get behind that is way different from this uh, whole very linear, very patriarchal, in my view, uh, Hegelian dialectic that has almost subconsciously, well, actually really subconsciously infiltrated a lot of our consciousness in terms of how we think about politics. I think we just need to find an actual third way that's not communitarianism uh, that can just take us off of this, let's get off of this uh, Hegelian train and let's start thinking about how we can start learning uh, to live more in harmony with the state of nature. Uh, that's where I'm coming from, and I think Jason is excited about working on this show, too. We were talking about calling it uh, crypto and technocracy, uh, but we might be thinking about finding a new name. So stay tuned to that, and again, you can go to www.theshiftnow.com, uh, and uh, if you sign up for the newsletter, then you'll be getting all the information at least a couple times a month, uh, all the new stuff that's coming out of the Shift Studio. You can also find me on Facebook at Doug McKinty, on YouTube and Odyssey at The Shift with Doug McKinty. Um, I've got a Shift with Doug McKinty Telegram channel if you're interested in finding me there. Uh, I am at D McKinty on Twitter. And... Uh, um, I'm also on a number of other social media sites, so you can just look me up, but uh, check out the website. That's the best way to get in touch. So thanks to everyone for listening, and uh, I will be putting out um, more stuff later. I'm getting busy, a couple different shows a week, so uh, stay tuned for everything I got coming out. And uh, again, you guys have a great day. Take care. Take care.